Verse 5, we'll read it all the way to verse 9, and then we can pray. Verse 5, for this reason I left you in Crete, that you would set in order what remains and appoint elders in every city as I directed you. Namely, if a any man is above reproach, the husband of one wife, having children who believe, not accused of dissipation or rebellion. For the overseer must be above reproach as God's steward, not self-willed, not quick-tempered, not addicted to wine, not pugnacious, not fond of sordid gain, but hospitable, loving what is good, sensible, just, devout, self-controlled, holding fast the faithful word which is in, uh, in accordance with the teaching so that he will be able both to exhort in sound doctrine and to refute those who contradict. Let's pray. Father, Lord, as I prepare to even speak your word, grant me the grace to speak with clarity, with conviction, with humility. I ask that you would purify my heart from any selfish motives, any distractions, that you would guide me by your Holy Spirit, that I may faithfully declare, declare your truth, the truth of your gospel. May your word penetrate hearts, convict souls, and bring about transformation. Lord, give me the wisdom, wisdom that I may rightly divide the word of truth and to minister to those who hear. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So, I'll give you my title in a bit. As we know that Everybody know the, the title of this part. If most of you have your Bibles, it says qualifications of elders. You know, in Paul's opening greeting to Titus, he reveals his missionary strategy centered on the preaching of the gospel to the building up of the faith. Go to verse 1 for me, and it says, Paul, a bondservant of God, an apostle of Jesus Christ, for the faith of those chosen of God and the knowledge of the truth which is according to godliness. If some of the some of the LSV reads, for the faith of God's elect, that is the reason why he was called. That is why he's an apostle, for the faith of the elect. The office of elders. There's a few things that I would like for you to know if you did not know this already. The New Testament establishes two ordained offices for the Christian church. And that is elders and deacons. But I want you to, I want you to notice this, that the Bible does not ordain popes. It doesn't even ordain apostles. It doesn't ordain anything else but elders and deacons. And the reason I bring that up to you is because we follow the Word of God. We follow what it says. We don't follow man-made traditions. We follow what is explicit and even implicit, meaning that we should have an understanding of what the Bible teaches. So elders were given the authority. I want you to remember this. All elders are given the authority for the ministry of rule. And deacons, the authority for the ministry of deeds. So if you wanted to just understand what is the difference, one is to rule is, and the other, the deacons, are for deeds. And when I talk about elders, those are the people that are the leaders of the church. The, the, the ones that are 
are taking care of the church day in, day out. The ones that are shepherding the flock. Notice that Paul does not give, again, any sets of qualifications, uh, of, for two sets of qualifications for, for elders. Uh, you know, let's say, well, elders, these kind of elders got to do these. These kind of elders have to do that. But in likewise, in 1 Timothy 3, 1 to 7, does provide, um, it gives you more information about what elders, and some translate overseers or bishops, but I'm going to explain to you a little bit that they basically are over, they overlap. They, one does not do more than the other. Elders, bishop, overseers are intermingled, also pastors, and they, they talk about shepherds. Some people say that the reason why, uh, as I read commentaries, the reason why they even changed from elders to overseers or is because the elders, as we read presbyteros, pres, pres is more of a Jewish the word in the elderly, the older people that used to rule the synagogues. And the episcop episcopos, which is the Greek word for overseer, is more the Greek side of it. So they just kind of put it together so you could say, look, this is the, the Jewish side and this is what was the Greek side. Calvin writes in the teaching of Titus that it plainly shows that there is no distinction between a presbyter and a bishop, overseer, for he now calls indiscriminately by a, la uh, a later name. Those whom he formerly called presbyters, and farther, in conducting this very argument, he employs both names in the same sense without any distinction. Again, the elders and overseers are the guardians of the church, the church doctrine and the practice as well as spiritual leaders of the church members. Elders, as Paul wrote, are the shepherds in Acts 20, 28. The, elder, the, the shepherds of the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. A third designation is added in Titus 1, 7. An elder or overseer is God's steward. In the ancient world, a steward was entrusted with the key of his master's house, both to open the door and to dispense its treasures. So likewise, elders are entrusted by Christ to grant admission to his church, to believers, to minister God's grace through prayer, the ordinances, especially the ministry of God's word. They are to do God's work in God's way for God's people with accountability to Christ, to Christ for their faithfulness. Now, before we get into the explicit qualifications of an elder of these men, I want to talk to you about what I mentioned before, the implicit qualifications, meaning these are to be understood without being said outright. And first, the church is supposed to be governed. We're not supposed to be governed by a single elder. We've, some of us have come from a church where we understand that the, the senior pastor, the main guy, he makes all decisions. Everything runs through that. And some of us call that the Moses model. That is not biblical. The Bible clearly teaches here, and even if you read verse verse one, verse one, 5, it says, For this reason I left you in Crete, that you would set in order what remains and appoint elders. Plural. Then say appoint one elder per church. Appoint elders. And then it says, um, well, I'll tell you about right now, but we see that principle of eldership rule in Acts chapter 15, verse 6, in when the Jerusalem Council came together, where it says that the apostles 
And the elders were gathered to consider these difficult matters. So the apostles and elders came together. So if the apostles came together with elders, how much more do elders at any other church need more elders to bring wisdom and insight to whatever is going on with the church, whether it's small or big? We need elders in the church. Second, notice that all elders are to be local. Again, it says Titus must appoint elders in every city. Every city. This approach grants us elders to get to know the flock, right? If, if one of the elders lived three hours away, how would you even get a chance to talk to him? You could call him, but he would never come to you, come to the show, you know, if something happened in your house, he would never be able to come to you and actually minister to you because he lives three hours away. But that principle also applies to church membership. It applies because we, we, we tell you, you need to be part of the local church. The reason and the main reason why we left grace in the valley was to become part of the local church. Most of us lived here in the South Bay, and we needed to be part of a local church. We can't be in fellowship with people in, in the valley. We can call them. Yeah, we can drive an hour, an hour and a half if we can in traffic. But that's not practical. That's not biblical. We need to stay where we are called to be. We need to make sure that we invest our time with the people that God has called us to be here. Imagine if I was an elder and I said, you know what, I'm just going to go visit other churches and I'm just going to be a half an elder over there sometimes. You know what I would do? I would be, I would be in a sense, and it would be a weird way, an adultery, weird way, because I would be not being with them. I would be with them instead of with you. Do you understand what I'm saying? I would not do that. It would not be right. It would be wrong for me to spend time with other churches and minister to them when you are the flock, when you are the people that I am supposed to minister to. It's happened many times before. Ministers get uh, a lot of speaking engagements, and so they're now all, all over the place, and they forget about their church. It has to be appointed in every city. A third principle is that elders or leaders or overseers are exclusively male. Again, we see that in Titus 1.6. It says, namely, if a man is above reproach, what does it say? The husband of one wife. I mean, how clear can that be? You have to be a male. And that word, husband, is the Greek word aner, specifying the male sex. It has to be a male. And, and again, Paul prohibited women from ordained leadership in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 12. He says, I do not permit a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man. What does that mean? It means exactly what it says. He does not permit a woman to teach and to exercise authority over a man. It's not, it's not complicated. And the reason for male leadership is not because women lack spiritual character or the ability that man does that men possess as a matter of fact that's not true I've, I've seen women be better teachers than some of the men that being said the reason why it's because that is God's order in the human society that's and you see that in Genesis chapter 2 so keep that in mind it's it is the way God has ordained it 
But before, again, I give you my points, now, let me tell you my, my, um, my title. The title that, I, I, as I debated on that one, is instead of qualifications, qualifications of elders, because, you know, when you think about, oh, I'm just going to talk about guys that uh, want to be leaders in the church. Of course, that's ultimately what he's talking about. However, that being said, my title is going to be Qualifications of Men. That is my title. And the reason why is, as I take you to chapter 2 of Titus, go to chapter 2. I'm going to read to you a verse, verse 1, and I'm going to let you, as I read, I'm going to explain to you why I decided on this. It says, but as for you, speak the things which are fitting for sound doctrine. And it says, older men are to be temperate, dignified, sensible, sound in faith, in love, and perseverance. Now, what does it say? Older women likewise are to be reverent in their behavior. Not malicious gossips, nor enslaved to much wine, teaching what is good, so that they may encourage the young women to love their husband, to love their children, to be sensible, pure workers at home, kind, being subject to their own husbands, so that the word of God will not be dishonored. What does it say about young men? Look at verse 6. Likewise, urge the young men to be sensible. Oh, where's the list of the young men? Uh, uh, there's a list of younger women, how they're supposed to be taught this. But where is the men? Where, where is the list for men? It's not there. It's, it, as a matter of fact, it almost says like, look, guys, just don't kill yourself. Until you become older, until you get to the point where you're able to become an elder, and you're able. But that's the that's the that's the thing about the scriptures. You have to be able to understand what it's saying. Now, look at verse seven. In all things, show yourself to be an example of good deeds, with purity and doctrine, and dignified, sound in speech, which is beyond reproach, so that the opponent will not put to shame being. Nothing, having nothing bad to say about us. Now, I want you to think about this. If, because there is no list for men in this chapter, for young men, what are we to do with that? If, if, and only if, if verse, if verse, chapter 1, verse 5 to 9, the what about qualifications for elders, was only meant for elders, then how can he be how can Titus or any other man be an example to only men that are going to be elders? The, re the, only, the only way you can actually justify that, well, it's like if, if it wasn't supposed to be for, uh, only for elders, it's like me saying, well, none of you are going to be elders, so you know what, I'm going to try to be an example to you about how to be elders, but it's like me teaching a, a person that doesn't have legs, how to play soccer. Or like a guy that's going to throw, let's throw the football around, but he has no arms. That's just the only way that, that, that it, it makes sense if you read it that way. But the fact is that because there is a list, and the list is back in chapter 1, that is why you're supposed to model. That is, that's how you're supposed to set example. Now, the last thing I want you to think about is if this list, back in Titus chapter 1, of qualifications for elders, that I will, again, the reason why I put my title is qualifications for men. If this list was given to you and you said, look, I want you to give, I, I want you to put this list and tell me what you don't want on your son. What, what is it that you would just take off about your son? You'd be like, oh, let me see. Yeah, it, nope, 
everything. I would not take anything off that list. I want my son to be hospitable. Or what about if your son was a verse 7 guy? He was self-willed, quick-tempered, addicted to wine, pugnacious, not fond to sort it, of sort game. You would be like, whoa, that's, no, no, I, I got to root that, that, man, he needs to have an exorcism or something because there's no way my son is going to be like that. Okay, so, but then he goes verse 8, be, but you know what? Be hospitable, loving what is good, sensible, just, devout, self-control. Yes, that's what I want for my son. Right? So in a way, you would say, yeah, I want to tightly say uh, one eight, man. But what about verse 9? Oh, that's for elders for sure. It talks about, you know, the faithful word and, and, and being able to exhort and sound doctrine, refute those who contradict. But if everybody here, every man that is sitting in this room and that can hear me, who... If you do not understand this, if you do not hold fast to the faithful word, how are you going to wash your wife with the word? How are you going to do that? How are you going to, to share the word to your children? How are you going to even minister to anybody? How are you going to do any of these things? You won't, but you want to and you know you should. And the only way you're going to do that is that you hold fast to the word and you teach. And it's not about if I have the feeling to do it. It's about just doing it. This is the only way you're going to be a godly father. So my three points. Um... Is our man of godly competence, verse 6. Uh, my second point will be man of godly character, verse 7 and 8. And my third point will be man with godly convictions. And I want you to pay attention to this also, ladies, because this, this is not just about the man. You will have to, you will have to decide, those of you who have young young boys, you're going to have to decide, this is the kind of boy I want. And those ladies that are looking to get married, this is the kind of man I want to marry. Those are the things you have to look at. So it's not, this study is not just for the men that are here. This is for every single one, of for Joaquin over there, for all the little kids that are here, every single kid that is in this room, because this is what you need to look to. This is what you're going to strive for. That is what you're going to try to do. If you don't reach that, then you have not, you, you, there's something going on in your life that you need to root out. Every single guy here. Now, man of godly commitments. And it says, In verse, in verse 6, if a man is above reproach, if any man is above reproach, the word, some of your Bibles say blameless, but we know uh, most of our Bibles say, says above reproach, and does not mean that you have to be sinless, the only sinless person that has ever been is Christ, but rather you have to have a strong reputation to be competent. And, and what area is he asking you to be competent in? He says, the husband of one wife, having children who believe, not accused of dissipation or rebellion. Now, the husband of one wife, if you don't know, it doesn't mean that, uh, you know, it's not talk about necessarily polygamy, although, of course, it's, it's already given. The Bible says clearly that we doesn't teach polygamy. And if you wanted to say polygamy, there is another word for polygamy, so in Greek, so it's not talking about polygamy. It's talking about a one woman man, meaning that 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 you only have eyes for one woman, that your eyes don't wander, that you're not a as uh, well. I don't know if they're playing. 
is that what you guys call it now? The young, but a player. You're not a player. You just go around trying to talk to every girl that's around. That that's basically what he's telling you. You need to be a one woman man. And then, so, um, but think about this uh, about the children part. The word for children is techna, right? Which usually means implies children in, in the household. The NSB says having children who believe. But I, I think uh, the LSB says it better. The Legacy Standard says having faithful children. There is a debate, of course. People say, no, nope, you have to have believing children. If you don't have believing children, you are not qualified to be an elder. Um, you know, but in principle, however, if you do not have believing children, if you don't have believing children, what does it say about your leadership? What does it say about you as a man and the leader of your household? So if, if you have children that are none are believers, what are we going to have to say about your leadership? If you, and it's, it's clear in verse, in chapter, oh, in 1 Timothy, he says, he must, he must be one who manages his household well, keeping his children under control with all dignity. Now, pay attention to this part because this is not me. It says, but if a man does not know how to manage his own household, how will he take care of the church of God? You see, even if even if it doesn't say that they have to be believers, that they just as long as you're faithful, that they're not being rebellious, that they're not in sexual uh, sin, they're that's okay. You're, you're good. No, you're not. You will be checked. You will, we will find out why your kids are not believers. And you will be disqualified. My second point is a man of godly character, verses 7 to 8. Like in rapid fire succession, Paul lists 11 character qualities of a man growing out of his blameless life as a God, God called steward. The first five are the negative ones. That's verse 7, and the following 6 and verse 8 are positive. And we're just going to go through them so that you can understand what they actually mean. Sometimes, you know, in the NASV or other translations, they, it, it might not be as easy to understand. We don't use some of these words on a daily basis, but some are easier. Um, but let's talk about the five negative in verse, in verse 7. Not self-willed. That just speaks of a man that is arrogant, stubborn. Some of us have met people like that. That they, they, they don't want to hear you out. They've already made the decision. And no matter what you say to them, it's almost a waste of time to talk to them. That is not a man of godly character. If, again, I want you to think about this. If you see that in your son, if you see that in your, in the person you're courting, if you see that in yourself, you need to root that out. You need to ask the Lord to take that away from you. Not self-willed, arrogant, stubborn. The other one is not quick-tempered. John MacArthur says, a qualified pastor must carefully guard against the spirit of hostility, resentment, and anger. He can work with others in kindness, patience, and gratitude. Quick temper is, um, is definitely, uh, it's not something that anybody wants to deal with. They walk, you walk on eggshells with that kind of person. You, you, you can't even say anything remotely wrong because then, boom, they get you. 
And they look at you and they say, what? And they are not patient with you. They're, they can't wait to tell you what's wrong with you. And you feel like, man, I, I'm walking on eggshells with this person. Not addicted to wine, number three. Obviously, in other translations, it just says drunkard. Simple. John MacArthur also says about alcohol, most elders in modern cultures have no justifiable reason for drinking any alcoholic beverages and putting themselves in the way of temptation. They also have a responsibility, even more to other believers, to avoid, avoid exercising a Christian liberty that might, then, he, then he's, he quotes 1 Corinthians 8, somehow become a stumbling block to the weak and cause fellow believer to be ruined. The brother for whose sake Christ died. This is 1 Corinthians 8, 9, and 11. Can I be addicted to wine? Can I be a drunkard? It, it, it cannot be, a, it, it's as simple as that. It's not complicated. Not pugnacious. That word, we, I don't use it. I mean, I've just heard it. But I don't use it a lot. Like, you're a pugnacious man. It just means violent. You're a violent man. You just want to fight all the time. Like, literally, fist fight. Like, you just you want to take it outside and fight. That's the kind of man you are. I, I've met people like, like that. That they literally just can't wait to fight. It's, you know, listen. This list is literally for men. This, this list, you don't read that part in the girls' side or the ladies' side. Don't be violent trying to fight. No, it doesn't say that. It only says that for men. And you see that when the guys are all wrestling in the back, you know, they're like, got to get some testosterone leveled out. And they're fighting all these youngsters over there. And when you go to a house, they're like, hey, my nephews and my son are fighting. In the, and I still do that. But, but do you understand that they could just get to a point where, like, it's so much fun to be violent? They, they get a high off of it. And that's not the type of man you want to be with. That's not the type of pastor or elder you want to be associated with. 1 Timothy 3.3 3 says, uh, has the counterpart of violence. Because it also it gives you the other list, right? But it says, not violent, but be gentle. Men should lead, not lead by force, but by being, by humble services. You should be humble. You should be able to, to when people do call you out, it shouldn't even bother you. People call you names, whatever, bro. Like, it doesn't bother me. Go away. It, doesn't, it shouldn't bother you when people call you out names or they even they, they want to do something to you or, you know what, that's not me. You know, we can talk about self-defense and all that other stuff, but in the sense of most of the time, in the sense of being a man of God, this is your mindset. This is who you're supposed to be. Now, the fifth and final Negative one, it says, not fond of sordid gain. In other words, not being greedy or not pursuing dishonest gain. I mean, I mean, you could talk about pastors uh, that, um, that all they wanted to become rich because, oh, prosperity gospel or, you know, whatever it might be. But it's all about them. It's all about how, what I can get from this church. But even in the smallest sense, the people that come to our church are members, the men. You know, why do we teach our children? You need to share. Stop being selfish. We teach our, our little boys to do, not to, to be selfish. Because we don't want them to be greedy. We don't want them to pursue dishonest gain. And before I go to the positive um, I want you to remember this, ladies. 
especially if you're courting, especially one day you desire to court, if, you know, especially not only the ladies, but the, but the men and, and, and the ladies that have, that they have ladies that are young. If, if your daughter, or if you know this man has these qualities or not qualities, these, these negative qualities, while you're courting, don't ever think, wow, I have to pray for him. And, and when the when we get married, the Lord will change his heart. No, he's going to get worse because now he's got you and now he doesn't have to worry about anything. That's just what happens. Is, look, listen, everybody knows that. Everybody that's older here is, is know, knows that at least. But everybody that's young is stupid and they think that, oh, no, 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 no. No, yes. Please listen. You, it's not going to happen. A guy will not change for you. And that's why I keep telling the young, the young ladies or even the, the young men. So listen, you are not her counselor or his counselor. You are not his therapist. You are not any of that. So you need to either accept him the way it is or just break up with the guy. Because you don't need to change him. You, you just don't need to change the guy. That is not your, that's not what you're supposed to do. But, oh, I love him. I don't care. Go away. I don't care about that. Listen to the word of God. Listen to the word of God. But when we get to the positive, these are the nice ones. You know, everybody wants this kind of, uh, kind of man. Be hospitable. I, everybody kind of knows what this is. You know, I love that uh, about our church. People come to our church and and they and I, they're better than Chick Fil A. Okay, just give you that. Better than In and Out. But they come to our church and they say to us, "Man, I just feel like everybody knew me. Like I got greeted so many times." And that, that's a blessing to me, and I know it's a blessing to you guys getting to know other people. And um, I, I want you to understand that that being hospitable is not just obviously for men; it's for everybody. Consider what our Lord uh, says to the saints uh, when he when they're gathered for praise in the final judgment in Matthew twenty-five. 36 to 30, uh, 35 to 36. You guys know this. Everybody knows this. It says, I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. That's so important is the compassionate care and hospitality that Jesus continued in verse 40 of that chapter, chapter 25. And he says, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. That is how we need to see the ministry of hospitality. When a person, a brand new person comes, when a person that you don't know out there it's a ministry of hospitality, of being hospitable. We need you never know if that person you meet outside is going to show up in this church. Now, uh, you know, doesn't mean you get run over and people you just let people say whatever to you, but you need to make sure that you're hospitable. You that you need to talk to people in a godly way. Number two is. Loving what is good. And a good definition of this is in Philippians 4, 8. Everybody knows this one also, but I want you to keep that one. Is this, finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there's any excellence, and if anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. That is loving what is good. Some of you are pessimists. They, you can't wait to think about the worst outcome of whatever is happening in your life. You worry about things that you don't know, even know are going to happen. You worry about these things. You say, 
and I ask you, why do you worry about these? Uh, well, well, it could happen. So what? Don't worry about that yet. Wait until it happens and then deal when it deal with it when it happens. But in the meantime, love what is good. We must be that type of, of men and women, and we need to make sure we, we tell our kids to be that type of men and women. Now, the third one is sensible. And this one's a pretty interesting because, uh, again, this is almost, it's kind of piling up on each other. It says sensible, and uh, that's having a right perspective and it's characterized as being sensible. That's what it means. Like be you, you, because other translations have it self-controlled, but you have to be sober-minded, under mental and emotional control. I have met men that are not under emotional control. Oh man, I can't handle those guys. I just want to like, bro. I seriously, don't, I'm going to be honest with you guys. The people that get under my skin the most are that type. That are emotionally, I'm talking about men only though. Emotionally are not under control. Those men just uh, irk me. And I just like, I can't handle it. I just, I'm getting better, all right? I'm getting a little better. I remember one time, I, he was sitting, this guy was right next to me, and I was like, man, I was having like a panic attack because I wanted to leave. I didn't want to talk to the guy anymore because I couldn't handle his, his, his the way he was acting and what he was telling me and what he was, uh, I was like, somebody save me. I, and that's just the way, I, I, that's what I was feeling at the time. And now, you know, I'm a little bit better, but not that much, but I'm still a little better. Just give you a heads up. But this man, the sensible man, acts with wisdom and common sense. Okay? Not just common sense, because common sense nowadays is not so common, but common sense, a lot of people have common sense, but you need to have wisdom. Wisdom comes only if you know the Word of God because you have the knowledge of the Word of God and you use that knowledge to, for wisdom. But some people have been blessed. Have people have been given an ability to have common sense. But you need to add it with wisdom. This virtue, again, is so crucial to the health of the church that Paul mentioned it five times in the first two chapters. In verse 1-7, as you see in verse 2, 2, uh, chapter 2, verse 2, chapter 2, verse 5, chapter 2, verse 6, and let's go to chapter 2, verse 11 and 12. It says, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, instructing us to deny ungodliness, and worldly desires, and to live sensibly, you see, righteously and godly in the present age. You see, you need to live sensibly as opposed to ungodly, as opposed to having worldly desires. The next one is just some of your translations say righteous. That just means being fair, impartial, honest in how you deal with others. I'll tell you this much. Credibility in the ministry can stand or fall right here. Because if you're not a just man, if you are unfair and you are impartial, what is going to happen in your ministry? Not only will they you impute the character of God, but they don't want to be here. You 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 have your own little clique over here, bro. I don't want to be here. No, no, you, 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 that's not that's not me. 
your ministry could just be blown to pieces because you are not a just man. Number five is devout. devout. Again, some of them say holy, but this is just a devout enthusiasm for piety and worship. That is the type of man you want. A man that can't wait to worship God. A man that, you know, whether he's in front of 100 people or in front of two people, he will show piety. He will be godly. That's the kind of man you want to be around. The last one is self self control. This means having control over oneself and being control of one's strength. A lot, of, a lot of us have a quick tongue, you know, and you can hurt people really fast with your tongue. And it, 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 sometimes it's a strength because you can use it for good. But other times, you use it to hurt people. And you need to control that. You need to have mastery over your passions and your impulses. Bringing the will under the that will under the control of the God that we love and trust. This kind of self-control is only possible for the person who is mastered, who has mastered the Word of God and is led by the Spirit of God. That is the only man who can truly be self-controlled. It's like a, a person that that if there was a lamp, and you said, turn on that lamp. Be like, well, I'm trying to turn it on. It doesn't work. It just doesn't work. Well, you know why it doesn't work? You need to plug it. That's where the power comes from. And a lot of people are not plugged in to the Word of God, They're not being equipped by the Spirit. And so that is the only way we're truly going to be, we're going to be self-controlled. And lastly, man of godly convictions. We're not. We're not. Um, I'm not take too long on this one because I will um, reiterate it next. My next study, because this is a big topic. But man of godly convictions, being devoted to the truth, holding fast the faithful word, means respecting the Bible as the inspired, infallible, the inerrant. Word of God. That is what you need to. That is the conviction you might have. You must have when speaking the word. It's not what. I, oh, and let me tell you what the Bible says. Yeah, you tell them that, but you tell them with conviction. You tell them as a matter of fact. You are wrong because the Bible said it, not me. I don't. You. You don't have to worry about what I say. Let me tell you what the Word of God says. You need to affirm the Bible's priority, authority, sufficiency, that what we believe is how we will live. That we need to minister in places that you normally wouldn't minister to because God has called you to do so. The faithful elder is both teacher and defender. A preacher and a physician. Uh, let me tell you something. It's a quick story. It's a funny thing that happened. My sister the other day ended up at, at some church. Um, that guy that she went to go visit is the pastor of the school of her son. Her son, the school's the, the children's pastor. She's just like, ah, whatever. I, I don't like that guy. You know? She shows up to the Bible, the, the Bible study or the Sunday. I'm not sure what day it was, but. She listens to the guy, and she says, oh, you know what's weird? She's like listening to the guy. She's like, he reminds me of what's, uh, he reminds me of the way John MacArthur preaches. And he, as a matter of fact, the way Ulysses preaches and the way my brother preaches, they all they kind of sound like, like that. That's the kind of way, you know, that it's weird. And so she started finding out what was going on with this guy. Ends up being he's a TMS grad. You know, when... When things like that happen, you praise God because you know that there not only is there men out there 
teaching the word of God correctly, expositing the word the way it's supposed to be exposited. But, but, but my, my sister doesn't even go to a church that, that does it that way, per se. But she was able to see the difference in just listening to the guy and say something, is, I like the way that guy's doing it. And, and she found out, and he's a team of grad. She, she ended up talking to that guy. and such. I mean, the story is, is better than what I said, but it's a good story. But look, I love what John Calvin, quote, uh, John Calvin said. The pastor ought to have two voices, one for gathering his sheep, another for warding off and driving away wolves and thieves. Scripture supplies him with the means of doing both. And isn't that true? We can't just be, you know, just not, you know, walking around like, like little saints and then, oh, people say things. No, if somebody comes and tries to div make division in, in, within our church, you know what? We are going to call him out. We are going to, we're going to make sure that this guy does not sow division within our church, whether it's doctrine or gossip or slander. We need to, we, we are going to do that. Romans 16, 7 says, now I urge you, brethren, keep an eye on those who cause dissensions and hindrances contrary to the teaching which you learned and turn away from them. That is what we are called to do. But not only us, but every, every person here. I leave you with this scripture. And it's in Romans, I mean in Colossians 1, 28 and 29. It says, we proclaim him, admonishing every man and teaching every man with all wisdom so that we may present every man complete in Christ. For this purpose also I labor, striving according to his power, which mightily works within me. That is, in a way, my whole sermon. That is what my heart is. I know the heart of Pastor Ulysses is that we would love for you to be complete in Christ and that we will labor according only to his power works within us. Let's pray. Gracious Father, we thank you for the privilege of hearing from your word this evening, Father. We praise you for the truth that is revealed. Lord, as we reflect again on your word, we pray that it would take root deep within us, transforming our lives according to your will. And may the seed sown today bear fruit in abundance bringing glory to your name. I have strength to live out the truth that we have heard and power us to walk in obedience to your word. Or may your spirit continue to work in the hearts of those who've heard, drawing them closer to you and shaping them into vessels of your love and grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.